Uh, good evening, everyone. Let, let me begin. I know there are people coming in. If you do have a seat, um, could you please let people know as they come in that you have a vacant seat? Uh, first of all, I should um, tell you that maybe we should have had this in a bigger venue. And you know what? I knew that you would come out for Brockton Kids House. I have to tell you that this started a long time ago. This isn't just about a budget. It's about our kids. And I, you know, many of you know I've been in the district. Next year, I'll start my 40th year in the Brockton Public School. I live with you here in Brockton. My children have been educated in the Brockton Public Schools. And it matters that our children get the education that you want for them, what we want for them, and certainly what they deserve. because. I have listened long and hard about so many wonderful things about Brockton. We talk about revitalizing downtown, and that's great. You know, we talk about all kinds of plans for business coming in, and we need that, and that's great. But before we can do all of these things, the most important thing are those youngsters that come to us, some of them as young as three years old, all the way up to our 12th graders. They have made us proud for many years. We get many awards. Our teachers do excellent work with your children. And we know that our parents care. So tonight, uh, before I do begin, I want to thank, and I want to let you know, and I can see people out there, but I want to thank the elected officials that are here. Uh, if you can just give me a wave of your hands. I know I saw uh, Brett Gormley School Committee, Lisa Plant School Committee. I saw Winter Farwell, our city councilor, former mayor. I saw Moses Rodriguez, our councilor at large, Tim Sullivan, Wood 7 school committee member. Um, again, if I've missed you, Jack Lally down back, our, our new uh, city councilor, Ward 6. And I will tell you this, that in coming on board as superintendent, one of the things I also knew about Brockton was that you have a group of people, your elected officials, that are willing to come together. We're not a city where we are arguing. We agree that our children need resources, that our children need to have instructional supplies, need to have the best teachers. So whether it is your school committee, or our city council, or our legislative group, who have absolutely been phenomenal, they are here to certainly support your children. So I feel very blessed, and I'm sure you do, that we're not a group to argue, we're a group that has deep discussions about what we need to do for kids. So let me tell you about this advocacy. What we have seen happening in Brockton is, again, there's a lot of stress on our budgets, not just our school budget, our city budget. And many of us are working to, again, support businesses coming in, ways that we can support our large city budget. But time is running out. So when you look at, and I have to take you back a number of years ago, the advent of what they call Ed Reform came in the early 90s, certainly before a lot of your children were even born. And what happened at that point in time was you had a case called the McDuffie case, came out of Brockton. And what the McDuffie case said was up at the high school, Jamie McDuffie was a student. Her father was actually on the school committee at the time. And in her classes, there were 35 to 40 kids. They didn't have the books that they needed at the time. We weren't able to hire the teachers, large class sizes. All of these brought about a change to how we fund education. Our property values and what other property values might be around the state. We're an urban center and we have affordable housing and that's good for us. But it also is difficult with our budget. And when Ed Reform came in, it said it didn't matter your zip code as to how we would fund education. And if the state had to step in to support, they would step in and support some of budgets throughout the whole Commonwealth. And when I say that, to be very honest with you, the state supports about 80% of our budget. Our city supports the other 20%. We have over a $220 million school budget for almost 18,000 students. We are the fourth largest school district in the state. And when that funding came about, this Chapter 70, it made a difference. Our class sizes went down. We were able to purchase materials and supplies. We were able to make sure our children had state-of-the-art back during the 90s. But recently, that formula 
has not been able to provide what we need. And I will tell you all of last year, and I don't want to go into it at great length, but there were hearings held all over the state, suburban, rural, urban centers, talked about what needed to change in that formula. Our own chief budget officer, who will talk to you tonight, Aljo Petronio, went around. It didn't matter if there was a hearing in Northampton, he was there. It didn't matter if it was down the Cape, he was there, because he brought the Brockton story out there about what our children deserve. We were waiting this year for the new Chapter 70. Hopefully, there were going to be some changes in this formula. We were very disappointed, and we are very dependent on that funding. We were very disappointed when that uh, budget came out, I would say sometime in early March, showing us that instead of listening to all of the things that we presented around the state, the governor's budget came out, and it was flat. And as a matter of fact, it discounted some of our low-income students in our community by a new formula that's coming into play that we were not aware of or was coming. So we are looking this year at close to a $10 million deficit. Now, I told you our budget is $220 million. But $10 million doesn't allow us to continue to hire high-quality teachers that your children deserve. The class sizes in our kindergarten classes are topping 27 students, wonderful little students coming to us. Some are English language learners. We have a large homeless population in Brockton, close to five or 600 students that we are glad they're here. We're happy to meet all of their needs. If you go to your neighbors in the surrounding towns, their kindergarten classes are 14 and 15 in a kindergarten class, and it's a different youngster. I'm up at Brockton High School, and I'm in lab classes, excellent teaching, and I'm looking at numbers of 25 and 35 in a lab class. There isn't a seat to be at in that class. And when I started talking to you, it's reminiscent of 1993 when Ed Reform came in because of young Jamie McDuffie at the high school sitting in a class of 35 students. So we have started our advocacy. Your legislative group has been excellent. Many of them can't be here tonight. I think Representative uh, Dubois was coming. I'm not sure if she's here yet. But I know Representative Cronin, uh, Senator Brady, and Representative Cassidy, I think, have other uh, appointments this evening. But basically, they have already been looking. When the governor puts a budget in, and this is why, again, when we finish up tonight, I want Governor Baker and everybody to hear that Brockton kids count to make sure that they're going to listen. <laughs> they should have been listening to that Chapter 70 recommendations when we're out there talking about our high needs population, the additional monies that we need for our English language learners, we have a large special education pro program in Brockton. People come here because of the excellent services that we provide for special needs youngsters. <laughs> but certainly all of that comes with a cost. Um, and you know, if you look at our strategic plan, we talk about instructional excellence, and you see that on our logo. We talk about supportive environment, and the one thing that was important to me coming into this job as superintendent, and the last pillar of our strategic plan is community engagement, and you have not disappointed me tonight. Thank you for coming out and being here with us tonight. campaign is done because you are the people that are going to make a difference. I had a number of elected officials say to me, I'm not sure I'm really hearing the voices. Please promise me that whatever we come up with as a community, your voices are going to be heard from the state house all the way to city government here. But that we're not finger pointing. We're willing to work together to make sure we get what our children here in Brockton deserve. And here's what they deserve. You deserve, as a community, a facility master plan that looks at, in the next 20 years, what do our schools look like? Are they schools of the past, or are they 21st century schools? Your children need to have technology in front of them all day long. 
one-to-one -one devices. They're not learning how I learned years ago with the book and paper and writing. They, have, they need corners of the room where they can have digital literacy, where they can be working with their other students in their classes, working on technology, analytical, solving problems, working together. These are the things your children deserve. And a facility master plan really might cost us some money in this community. And I'm going to tell you as I stand here as your superintendent, in bringing up two daughters in the city, my husband was also in education. And we've worked two and three jobs when our kids were in college because we wanted to make sure they could do things that kids throughout the state could do. And we didn't mind doing that. And I know no matter how stressed your budgets are out there, if in fact we have a plan in our city, whether it's for what we want to see for facilities, at Brockton High we should be building right now and we get reimbursement from the state, 90%. We should be building a STEM wing up there, science, technology, and then take down each of the houses and renovate them one by one. So just like all the surrounding towns you have, you'll have a new high school up at Brockton High. <laughs> but that comes at a cost, and we as a community have to look at our elected officials. Are we willing? to look at an override, a debt exclusion, where we have a particular project. And we're willing, and I'm not looking for people's taxes to go up, but are we willing to say that our kids deserve better? And yes, we want the state to do their part, but we have to also do our part. We should have a technology plan so that each of our schools are wired to make sure that the schools of the future are coming soon for your children now, who again, are the next generation that are going to be the taxpayers in Brockton. We want them to stay here. We want to be a vibrant community. We don't want people leaving. So tonight, before we leave, and you're going to hear a little bit from Aldo Petronio, our budget officer, just to kind of put into perspective what our budget does look like. You're also going to hear from some of our community liaisons who are working with the schools and what you can do as parents. And before we leave in the end, we've got things set throughout the uh, area here to get ideas from parents. Because we're going to keep in touch with you through your schools or through connections with social media. Because this needs to be a movement, just not for this budget. You're going to see the big billboard go, that goes up that, again, says Brockton Kids Count. And I will tell you my favorite line, and I know I saw Lisa Plant, our school committee uh, member from Ward 2. Lisa, where are you? Okay, Lisa, you're way back there. So Lisa, Lisa, I hope I'm quoting you correctly, and this is not going on the billboard, but I would have loved it. And the billboard up there, Brockton Kids Count, and it was, was it Tell Charlie? Ask Charlie, Brockton Kids Count. So that message, again, to our governor has to be loud and clear when he puts forth a budget. It has to make sure that it supports our children. So let me turn this over to Aldo Petronio. And before you leave tonight, make sure you get buttons. Make sure you get bumper stickers. I envisioned on every one of our lawns, and I can't wait to put mine in front of my house, and I live on the Brockton East and Stoughton line down in that corner and have for 30 years. And I can't wait to put my sign that says Brockton Kids Count. And it's going to stay there till we're properly funded, till we make sure there's dialogue in this community about our kids. Because that is your future. Don't talk about all of these other things that we do need to do until you start talking about kids first. So thank you. Good evening, I'm Aldo Petronio, and I'm going to try and do in about five minutes what we usually talk about for about four hours, which is our funding in the state budget. Every year, the governor puts forward House 1 or House 2 budget. In that budget is all of the revenues that are going to go to all of the cities and towns and all of the school districts. Every year, we receive a couple percent increase, usually just as part of, of uh, inflation in our budgets. This year, when that budget came through, the governor had an overall state revenues over 4% increase. Oh, a little louder. There we go. Okay. The state revenues this past year were a little over 4% uh, statewide. Now, when you, when, in knowing that, we expect some of that's going to come towards our way. The amount of that that went towards school spending was only 1.6%. 
That's overall across all school districts in the, in the Commonwealth. The problem is Brockton only received about 0.2% of that as an increase. So basically, we're what we call level funded, same money we got last year, being the same money this year. That to me is a cut in our budget. We expect a few million dollars every year of that share. And this year we did not get it. So the first question is how did that happen? So we received the, the my, child, my child's up in the wall. You can see the amount of revenues and how it ends up as far as Brockton gets. So if we go to the next slide. That money that gets dispersed is, goes through a formula called the Chapter 70 formula. And that formula looks at every community and sees the makeup of the community, what they can afford, and what the state can contribute towards that. So in that formula this year, there was an additional $72 million that was put into education. It's usually well over $100 million that goes into it. But the governor this year in, in low funding education put $72 million in. Even at that, Brockton expected their fair share. So what happened with that is out of 322 school districts, 194 of them received less than a 1% increase. The way the formula distributed the money this year, a lot more money went to other communities that, in my opinion, didn't need it as badly as Brockton and some of the other urban districts needed it. So, the governor has always, well, the state formula uses something called um, the low-income students. Everyone in the state receives a base amount for a student. Let's just for a rough number say $7,000. Then for every English language learner, you get a couple thousand more. For every special ed student, you get a couple thousand more. And for every low income student, which was determined by lunch applications, you'd receive about another $3,000. So the federal government has been pushing something called the Community Eligibility Plan. And that was intended for school lunch. They wanted to get out of the lunch application business. So by getting out of the lunch application business, we wouldn't have all those forms to process. What they wanted to do was say that anyone who's on state assistance will automatically be picked up by the state. They know who's on state assistance. You're automatically approved for free lunch. The problem in this year's budget is they're not looking at the lunch applications, which for Brockton was close to 83% free and reduced. They're looking at only students and families that are on state assistance. So that figure went down from 83% down to 55% of our kids. So that, in the formula, worked out that Brockton is not receiving the proper funding for all the children that we have. So we lost almost $6 million in that. But what the governor did for this year was, he said, I'm gonna hold you harmless. I'm gonna give you the $6 million back. But that left us basically level funded, which again is what I said earlier, is a cut. What he did do was said, well, because 194 of you districts are not getting extra money, I'm gonna give you $20 more per student. Brockton is 350,000. We usually receive 10 times that amount for our budget. So again, I look at that as level funded, I look at that as though they're cutting money out of Brockton and they're sending it elsewhere. So, in the overall budget, there was $55 million that was intended for low-income families. If you look at 322 districts and the size of the districts, Brockton being the fourth largest in the state, you'd think we'd receive a pretty good share of that. We received basically none of it. So, what we're saying now about Brockton Kids Count is we're trying to force the state to look at every one of the children that's in every one of our classrooms. And the fact that someone's not on state assistance could be simply they don't want to be on state assistance. It could be they don't qualify. It could be they don't know about the programs. But we still have to educate those children. We still have to provide the support and the teachers for this. So the battle right now with the governor is we want him to look at how they're looking at those numbers, looking at those children, and properly fund us. So the state will argue that we gave you an increase this year. They did, $350,000. The problem is our budget grows by millions every year. Everyone has a home, everyone knows that your phone bill goes up, electricity goes up, your wages go up, everything goes up. So the fact that we're receiving 0.2% increase is just 
unconscionable. If we receive fair funding, these are the items that we want to see. We want to see that we get proper funding for all children living in poverty. We need technology and computers for the mandated online testing. By 2019, we have to test every student in the district online. We have almost 18,000 students. We don't have 18,000 iPads. So, not only do you need them for the testing, but you need them to train the students before they're tested. They know how to take the tests. They've mandated that we do this, yet they don't give us the funding for it. We would like to see a cap of 20 students in kindergarten through the third grade. And a cap of 25 students for all other grades. We want to keep our teaching st staff intact. What the, what the state does with the budget that affects us is we end up hiring teachers, training them for a year or two, and then we lose them due to layoffs. Other communities that are receiving these funds are hiring the teachers that we train. We put the time and the effort into them, and then they take them. Our children have many social and emotional needs. We have a lot of immigrant students here, we have a lot of students that um, have various situations at home. We provide the services that the surrounding communities don't. That is a <laughs> That's an item that we pushed at the budget hearings, at the Foundation Budget Review Commission hearings around the state is that other communities can argue they need more money for expenses, but they don't have the students and the, and the, and the backgrounds of you know, the problems and emotional issues that we have. We don't turn any away. Matter of fact, it's been said that Brockton is the best. We do the best with those students of any other community in the state. So all we're asking for is the funding. As you all know, materials. We have printers, we have ink, we have paper, we have art supplies, we have science supplies. These items, individually per student, might not be expensive, but you multiply it by close to 18,000 students and it's millions of dollars. And the state needs to supply those. It's their job. We have, one of the great things that Brockton has is that we have sports and activities for all our students. Always, there are always things for our students to do. The busier we keep the students, the better they, the better they, they educate and grow, and they stay out of trouble. Other communities charge for these programs. We don't want to charge for these programs. You'll have haves and have nots. We have, we have five, what I call brand new schools. Believe it or not, they're really not brand new anymore. But we have five brand new schools, but we have some schools that are well over 100 years old. I think the Huntington was 1893 or something it was built. And we still fully, fully utilize it as we do the garter. These schools need to be upgraded. They, we need new schools, larger schools. The older schools don't have the technology built in. The amount of wiring and, and what's necessary in there to make them work. Bathrooms, gymnasiums, everything. We need that looked at. We're looking at a master plan, but we need the community involved in getting more of these new schools. Without the fair funding, this is what we're in, in fear of losing. We're looking at reduction in administrators. We're looking at reductions with teachers and support staff. Now, to the general public, they might say, well, that's fine, that's fine. You have to understand that we have children on IEPs, we have children that have special ed program plans. We have state mandates you have to meet for those students. You have time deadlines to meet them. If you don't, the state steps in, we get penalized or we get fined or the family ends up not getting the services they want. The state sets these mandates, but then they don't give us the funding to meet them. So that's something that's very critical we could lose. Our class sizes are growing, and we could be looking at 30 students in elementary, and at the high school, some classes as high as 40. That's 
we can barely fit them in the room. I don't even know if we have enough chairs in the room for that. So again, that's a problem. We have currently no additional fundings for computers and such. And it's one thing to buy a computer, but as most of you know who have you know, tablets and iPads, after three years they're pretty much outdated. So it's not as if we can say, oh, just wipe it out and put all new software on it. It doesn't happen. We have to continually upgrade our computers. Now, our suburban counterparts, they do that. Most of them have a, what they call a one-to-one. -one. Every student has a device. We don't have that. Again, we're in fear of falling farther and farther behind. We have computers right now that are eight years old that we just get by with. We have some that are new, but keep in mind, out of 18,000 students, I think we have about 6,000 or 7,000 computers. And again, some of them are eight years old. They run very slow, and they don't perform the tasks that we need them to perform. We're going to be looking at cutting classes and, and other tools as far as getting ready for college goes. Right now we have the core subjects, but a lot of the extra subjects that we have in there that the students like that are good for them, we're going to have to look at maybe cutting those courses out. We don't want to. Those, again, are what make Brockton High, especially the number one urban school in the country. We provide ROTC. We provide biomedical tech labs. These are things that other schools don't have. We're also concerned with reductions in our clubs and our sports, because we have to look at education first. All those come second. If, if we get down to larger class size or clubs, it's reducing the larger class size that we have to look at. Worst of all is potentially closing the school. We don't want to do that. If we do, we have to shift all the students at that school to the other schools, try and keep some of the teachers that we can. If not, we can't. There'll be more crowding in the other schools, the busing will be a little more difficult, we'll have more students on a bus. And it's, we're not discussing that because we don't want to go there, we're hoping it doesn't happen. But if, if more state funding doesn't come through, some things are inevitable. What we're asking is advocacy. We're looking for our message to get to the governor to the state officials, to city officials, to anyone that can hear our plight. We're looking especially right now at the House and the Senate, because the governor has put the governor's budget in, and the way the process works is the House then reviews the governor's budget, makes changes, then the Senate looks at it and puts their information or their changes into it, and at the very end they come up with what they call a compromise. We're looking to get to the House and the Senate and get our voices heard. Let them know that Brockton kids count. They have to provide the basis for our education that has been put out by the courts in the original McDuffie case, which became the Hancock case, which said that every student in Massachusetts will get equal opportunity at education. And we're on behind it. Thank you. Thank you. I have seen uh, some other elected officials come in. Uh, Vice Chair of our School Committee, Tom Minicello, Ward 1. Uh, City Council President, uh, Tim Cruz, Ward 1. And you do have your uh, legislator. I mentioned her earlier. I knew she was coming. Michelle Dubois is here. Hi everybody, I'm really impressed with the turnout here tonight. I'm not really surprised because Brockton parents care deeply about their children and always show up when they really need to be and even people without children like myself really care about the level of education that is offered in our community because if we leave kids behind, they don't get to do what they want to do and fulfill their full potential, move out of Brockton or stay. For, for me, I don't care, but we have a responsibility to provide them the opportunity that they need to be the full person that they want to be. So at the State House, I'm your state representative if you live in wards four, five, or six in Broxton, which is the other side of the railroad tracks. 
and I've met with the chairman of Ways and Means, Brian Dempsey, and um, one of my main um, talking points during my meeting with him about the budget was how low-income students are calculated and the way that the change um, has been made leaves Brockton funding deficient. And it's another attempt at transferring funding that's much needed in urban communities, I believe, into rich white affluent communities. Because if you can believe it, um, communities um, similar on the North Shore, they've actually had expanded foundation budget funding with the new calculation of low income. So if one person in their family, maybe grandma gets some kind of state subsidy, every child in that family counts as low income, even if they're living in a million dollar home. So it's, it's a very strange way that the change has been calculated that really hurts Brockton. I believe because a lot of families that might qualify for state aid choose not to accept it. And we also have undocumented folks that live among us that we care about and we have to educate all children equally. And so their families don't participate in the state subsidies and then their children are not counted in the proper way that we need to count them in order to be able to get the funding we need from the state to educate people so they actually have access to their full potential. So I understand the problem. I'm working really hard to fix that. It's just one of the ways that urban education is underfunded, I think, because of institutional racism that we all face living in Brockton. If you live here, we all face it. And at the State House, I'm fighting to try to overcome it. It's difficult. And if you would send these letters that are in this packet to the State House, it would really matter. So if you please send it to Speaker DeLeo and please send the letter to the President of the Senate. Yeah. Oh, we're going to collect them. So please fill them out. They're really, really important because if they hear from you or if you call them, they're going to listen to you because you're the taxpayers, you're the parents, you're the ones with the children that you care about and you love. So you call them sometime this week and they're going to listen to you. I mean, it may not solve all of our problems, but it's going to be at least equal to what I and the rest of the delegation and your city council is doing, because parents matter and kids matter. So thank you very much. Thank you, you know, again, uh, it, I don't want to present uh, gloom and doom, because let me tell you, I look out there and I see a lot of your principals out there, your administrators, and I'm also going to tell you, don't let anybody tell you at Tuesday's subcommittee meeting of finance, I stood before your school committee, and as we go through this process, I cut 1.5 million in administration, and it weakened our school district. It didn't strengthen us. You know, we're not top heavy. It sounds like a great thing to talk about somewhere, but we need the coaching. We need the administrator supporting. You ask your principals. You know, nobody has a minute. I look at that parking lot, the principals are there late at night, they're working with you, the assistant principals, the coaches, they're working with your children. And again, let me tell you before you leave, when I go to those classrooms, I'm impressed with, with what's happening. Your children are wonderful, they certainly are the future, it's the best part of my day when I can see what goes on. You have two level one schools in this district, and we're working hard to make sure every one of them is a level one or two school, reducing that achievement gap with the diversity of our population. That is a great thing that you're seeing in the schools. So we're gonna work very hard. We certainly need to have all our community support, and I have two women I'm gonna to introduce to you who are fabulous, who I have had conversations with, and we talk about how difficult it is to come before a community and say we not only need the state, but we need all of us here to, again, to commit to looking at our own budgets and how can we support our children. So let me first introduce you to Juliana Elaine Gill, Executive Director of Community Connections of Boston. Um, good night. I'm very excited to be here, and I was actually very excited to have a hard time to find parking. It's the first time that I ever felt that way. So I'm very happy to know, and as Michelle said, Brockton parents do come around, and they do support uh, all the work that's being done by the school system, and the hard work that the kids have been doing to learn and to succeed. Uh, I myself, I came from Brazil, and when I walk into the Brockton public school systems, I could not speak English. So as you can see, me speaking English today is due to the hard work of the wonderful teachers we have. Um, and thank you, Michelle, for um, some of the what you said. Brockton kids count, and your voice counts 
And it's very important that you, your neighbors, and everyone in the community understand the process and how this works. They can make all the decisions up there, uh, but they have to listen to you. You are taxpayers, you work, you buy, you live in the community, and uh, we put together some uh, a draft of letters that you can sign, and you can have your neighbors. The ones that are here today are going to be collected today, so we are asking people to sign in today. But we want your help to make sure that your voice gets heard so our kids get counted. It is unfair what they are doing, as Michelle explained, and much more can be talked about how um, they are hurting our children. Um, we need to make sure that if this doesn't only stay within the Brockton public school systems to think of ways to address this issue. We need a community, a movement that will make sure that people in the state house, and we come with your support, but it's not only Michelle's voice. They need to make sure that they know that Brockton community stands together to ensure that this unfair way of counting our kids will not continue because we year after year cannot be hurting our children because of some uh, un, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, unassessed way of or whatever it is that they thought about. I don't know who came up with this, but whoever it was wasn't thinking very clearly. And I would say to the person directly, but I'm, I don't know who it is. But we need to make sure that they start thinking of ways to address the issues that we have here and make your voice count. So make sure you, you um, sign this paper. We're going to collect today. We also want to make sure that if you would like to spend some time helping us connect with other parents, not everybody could come today. Actually, not everybody could fit here today. So I'm glad in a sense that if we had plenty thousand people here would be a little bit of a problem, but we do need the 20,000 people to speak up and to call, and they can, they need to hear us. This paper, the calls, any of meetings you can have, and we'll be glad to stand with you. If you would like to go to the State House, I'm sure we'll have opportunity to do that, uh, because your voice needs to be heard, because your kids count. And it's not just your kids, it's the, the kids of your kids, because if they start this right now, what do you think is going to happen three, four, five, ten years from now? This is something that would destruct what we've been building for a long time. So thank you so much. Like I said, I'm really glad and I'm really proud, proud to be a Brockton High School graduate, and I really want to make sure that every Brockton student get the opportunity that I did. She did. She wants to know how many years ago. 2003. She wants to know how many years ago. 2003. We also have uh, another uh, community uh, person, uh, Maria Wilson uh, Sepulveda, who is a mother of children in the Brockton Public Schools and works on that wonderful magazine. It's the Brockton Parents Magazine, excellent magazine. Maria? Good evening, everyone. Again, to reiterate everything that has been said, Brockton kids count. Let it be known that Brockton kids count. Please make sure that you take bumper stickers, you take the lawn signs, you put it there, you send these letters. Put your children's name on the letter so they know that we do have real children here in Brockton that need our, that need the funding for their education. I'm a Brockton High School graduate many moons ago. <laughs> My children are in Brockton Public Schools. I was educated um, in many of the Brockton Public Schools when I first came here. Did not speak a word of English myself and um, was in the bilingual program, the first bilingual program that Brockton had. So if I didn't have that back then, I wouldn't be able to speak to you, you know, in English. Y también en el español si lo necesitan. So please fill out the letters. There are three for the three different representatives. Get your bumper stickers, get your lawn signs. Brockton kids count. 
Thank you. I also uh, want to mention I saw Judy Sullivan, school committee member, Ward 5. I know she's down back. Um, I don't know if I have any of the elected officials that would like to speak to the community. Uh, any elected officials want to speak to their community? Counselor? Thank you very much. Um, the guys with the big voice, I guess it goes pretty deep. But my name is Moses Rodriguez and I'm a city councilor here in the city, but a, a proud graduate of the Brockton Public School System. I too share the same story with these two young ladies. On the other hand, the high school was built around me, and that's how long ago I graduated from Brockton High. But um, the reason why I'm here and we sometimes in this city tend to be a little too quiet. We tend to be a little too quiet, a little too nice. But the niceness hasn't really gotten us anywhere. If you sit down and think about it, we have one of the more violent cities in the Commonwealth. And how is the state paying us for that? By cutting the budget in our schools, by cutting the budget of programs that we have here in the city. Because you know why? Because they can. They can because they, don't, they do not fear the city. We are just two, a bunch of nice people that probably never make a phone call to the state house because we don't want to bother anybody. Well, you know why, folks? The time has come. The time has come for us to do that. And I, and I wish that the folks in the school system had some phone numbers up here because we need to start tomorrow morning making the phone calls not necessarily the city hall because we don't have anything to give you. The ones that are here, you know we support you, we know we feel your pain, we're with the schools, with the administrators, with the school committee. We don't have much to give out, but the state does, and it's the state that actually cut this. So it's up to us to basically inundate the phone lines at the state house. It doesn't matter who, I, I, was, I was telling the superintendent, it doesn't matter who you speak to, it doesn't matter who answers the phone, but we need to pick up the phone and call the state house and tell them that enough is enough, and we're not going to take this. Out. So I want to leave it here as clear as I possibly can, and I'm sure my colleagues of the city council, council president, whatever we need to do to help the school system, we're going to do that. Whatever we need to do to help the city, and I'm glad that this is not an election year that we're here talking about being re-elected or whatever. We're here because we care. And we're here because we feel that this is our city and nobody's going to run us out of this city and it's up to every single one of us to take ownership of the city. But let's start tomorrow. Let's start tomorrow with the photo. Thank you and please support the post in our school system. So, Mayor asking what are the next steps? We do have, and we have a lot of people, so down back there are lawn signs, there are bumper stickers, there are t-shirts, we've asked you to write letters. We will get back to you. We need your ideas. I spoke to one parent who said to me, I'm going to set up a hashtag account so people can start doing the kind of social media thing. I'm sorry, I'm not very good at it. So we are going to have our, on our website ways that you can help. We're going to do outreach to you through the schools, through your principals. You have parent uh, teacher conferences coming up at the elementary. We'll have a presence at every one of those elementary parent conference meetings. I don't care if you sign 10 papers. Get your relatives, the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, the neighbors. Go door to door. But before you leave, if you have ideas, grab a marker, give us an idea, and the last thing I want to tell you is please invite me or my leadership team to come to your schools, have a PAC meeting, have a special meeting, a smaller group. I'm glad to come and talk at any forum. So please get together, have letter writing campaigns, whatever you can think of is what community activism is all about. And in the end, we'll make sure our voices are heard all the way to Beacon Hill. All the way to Beacon Hill. Thank you.